This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Hello, friends, and welcome back. Today I'll be talking about instructions that Paul gave to Timothy. Timothy was a younger man, young fella, who was pastoring a church, taking leadership in body life, and Paul, as the older man, had some advice for him, and not only advice, but some commands, imperative commands, which I'll talk about later. What did Paul have to say to Timothy to instruct him and encourage him in the work that he was doing, and how does that relate to us? But before I get into that, I'd like to remind you that if you have any questions or comments, if you'd like to communicate with me about anything, please feel free to send me an email at ancientpaths at cantrell.cc. I'd love to hear from you. And also, just a reminder that I have a YouTube channel. Very, very few people visit the YouTube channel, but all of these podcast episodes are there and a bit more accessible because I've created playlists, and you can go through and search. If there's a teaching that you hear me refer to today, you can go back and easily find it on the YouTube channel rather than plowing backwards through your podcast feed. And if you do visit the YouTube channel, it would be great if you subscribed or hit the like button or all those things, whatever. If you appreciate the things that I share by commenting on your podcast player or visiting the YouTube channel. That just helps get the word out to other people. So I'd appreciate that. Also, before I start talking about Paul's admonitions to Timothy, I have a couple of things I want to share, one of which will lead us directly into a discussion about what Paul says in 2 Timothy. And there were a couple of things that stood out to me. I read the news on my phone or on my iPad using a program called Flipboard. I think that's what it's called. It consolidates news items, and then they have advertisements in there. And I saw an advertisement that, to me, is an essential statement of our hedonistic age. And I I wish I could uh, show you a picture of it, but I'll try to describe it. There's a young man, very healthy, very handsome, dark hair in a dark, well, in a black t-shirt, black jeans, sitting on a black sofa holding a very fancy black box that's full of what appear to be little bags of something. And the advertisement says, the headline says in the advertisement, welcome to an unparalleled laundry experience. (laughs) I don't know. It just made me laugh. Uh, The little blurb that I can read, I didn't click through on the ad. I didn't really want them to get clicks, but It says, elevate your laundry routine with this product. Don't sacrifice luxury fragrance for performance clean. (laughs) Yes, we can have an unparalleled laundry experience. Luxury fragrance and performance clean. Actually, clean there is a noun, I guess. Anyway, I just thought, what an appeal to our hedonism, that something that is so mundane and normal, just doing laundry, now can be elevated to an unparalleled laundry experience. (laughs) It's just an appeal to self, self self-gratification, and I imagine whatever this is that makes your clothes smell good and also cleans them probably is quite overpriced. And it's interesting that it's a young man sitting there, so it's probably all these single guys that have to go do their laundry, and they hate it, and they'd like it to be a little more interesting. (laughs) Uh, I remember when I first moved here to Russia, I lived in a summer camp out in the countryside, and uh, I had to do my laundry by hand in the bathtub, and I ended up with a particular set of blisters on my hand because as you do the laundry and then wring out the water by hand, I got those blisters in different places on my knuckles. (laughs) Okay, so the other thing that I saw was on social media. And I I don't know what it is. It's one of these little ads that a user on social media will plug their name into, maybe their birthday, I guess. And it's kind of a fortune-telling app. 
and then whoever the user is will post that on social media. This is what this program told me about, in this case, the coming year. Here are the things that this fortune-telling app told her about the coming year. Next year, she is going to have, here you go, here's the list, a loaded bank account, a healthy body, peace of mind, a love life that is happy, and a successful career. And when I saw that, I just thought, well, that is everything that appeals to self, that all of these things will come together. All of the things that the world tells us are the source of contentment and happiness. Money, health, peace of mind, happiness in a love life, and uh, success in our careers. I wonder if that app would ever say, you'll have great disappointment in the coming year. You'll face great loss. You're going to lose money on a bad investment. (laughs) I'm sure it doesn't say that. So the reason that I mention this in this context as we start talking about what Paul said to Timothy is this fortune-telling app says that these things are going to be the foundation of this young lady's life in the coming year. And I'm going to talk about what Paul wrote to Timothy. And I'll do a little bit of an introduction and then we'll get into it, uh, Second Timothy. I ran across this teaching the first time when I was working on the newsletters that Elizabeth Elliot wrote, and I was digitizing those so that they could be searchable uh, so that the team at the Elizabeth Elliot Foundation can do daily devotionals from that text. I came across this, and it was from her newsletter in early 1986. And then a little bit later, a friend of mine at a church in the United States did the same teaching for his Sunday school class. And I'm not sure if he got it from Elizabeth Elliot or if he got it from somewhere else. I don't know where she got it back in 1986, but he did it and sent an email as a follow-up to the Sunday school class. And I got it then, looked through it, and I thought, well, yeah, that's a good thing. It's a good structure to talk about what are the things that the Lord says to his people. So as we talk about these instructions to Timothy, I wanted to mention again something that I've said before. In the Mosaic Law, there are not just ten laws, the Ten Commandments. There are 216 commandments in the Mosaic Law. There's the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments, and then there's another 206 commandments in the Mosaic Law. And I was talking to somebody a few years ago, and I was making the point, as I do, that we're no longer under the Mosaic Law. Those 216 laws don't apply to us. However, under the New Covenant, any one of those laws that is mentioned again in the New Covenant, of course, then does carry over. It does apply to us. And there are some of the Ten Commandments that are mentioned in the New Testament, most of them, but there are some of those 216 commandments of the Mosaic Law that are not mentioned or are superseded under the New Covenant. And the guy that I was talking to said, well, You mean that we're not under law? We don't have any rules? And I replied with something that I had heard, which is quite true. Even though there are 216 laws in the Mosaic Law, there are well over 1,000 commandments in the New Testament. And by that I mean imperative statements. An imperative statement is a command. It's an instruction. And these New Testament imperative statements are commandments for New Covenant believers. An example would be rejoice always. That's an imperative statement. It's telling the listener, this is what you should do. Another example would be when Jesus says, do not worry about your life. That's an imperative statement. It's a commandment. We don't really think of it as a commandment like the Mosaic Law, but these are imperative statements statements. And there are some very good ones in this uh, second letter that we have to Timothy from Paul. And as we talk about this letter, I want to remind you, and of course myself as well, that when we read these letters in the Bible, we are listening to half of a conversation, a letter that is going from one side of the relationship to the other side. 
either from Paul to an individual or from Paul to a fellowship or from Paul to the church or from the writer of Hebrews to the Hebrew believers. And I have to remember that Paul isn't writing to me, he's writing to Timothy. However, we can learn a lot and we can assume that Paul would say much the same thing to us today. He is called the apostle to the Gentiles and I'm a Gentile. And the church is to give itself to the apostles' teachings, and so that's one very good reason to study these epistles. And God has preserved this letter in order to bring us closer to him. But still, we need to remember that this is Paul speaking to Timothy and encouraging Timothy. And we can read it, and we can understand things about the character of God. And I guess I would say that within this letter to Timothy is the Word of God for you and me, the living Word of God. It's contained here and in the other writings, but the living Word of God goes beyond the printed page, beyond the ink on paper, or beyond pixels on a screen. The Word of God is living and active. It's eternal. And as we read these words or listen to these words within the written text, Somewhere in there is this living word, and so let's listen for what God is saying to us. Now, the first thing that I want to focus on, and it's the first in this list, is from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. And it flies directly in opposition to this social media post that I saw, saying that in the coming year there would be health and peace of mind and money and a happy love life and success in the career. What does Paul say to Timothy? He says, take your share of suffering. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. 2 Timothy 1, verse 8. Paul says, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord. There's an imperative statement. Don't be ashamed to testify about Jesus. And Paul says, and don't be ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. That's what Paul says to Timothy, and it flies really in the opposite direction from having a luxurious laundry experience or from being told that the new year comes with all of these earthly pleasures. Paul is saying, join with me in suffering for the gospel. Don't be ashamed to testify about Jesus, and don't be ashamed of the people that do testify about Jesus. And we need to remember that If we boldly testify about Jesus, there will be opposition. Of course, there'll be spiritual opposition, but also, very often, we're going to have human beings come up against us, even members of our families who will push back or mock us. Dear friends, people who were close to me, but they are no longer close to me because I testify about Jesus as the Messiah. And we need to join in that suffering. We need to be willing to to take our share of suffering. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says that we should take strength from the grace of God. So even as we're taking our share of suffering, we can take strength because of God's grace. The Bible says here, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I would never encourage you to be strong in yourself. To say, oh, you can do it. You got it. The scriptures say that we should take our strength from God. Let his strength flow through us. That grace of God, that gift that we don't deserve. We can take strength in that. We can be strong in that grace. Just a couple of verses later, Paul says again, take your share of hardship. So here we see already, take a share of suffering, take strength, take hardship. And uh, starting in verse 3 of chapter 2 of Second Timothy, Paul writes, Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. 
endure hardship like a soldier. Soldiers don't just sit around, watch TV, and drink beer. Soldiers want to please their commanding officer, and they go through drills and hardship in preparation and then in the fight. And we are called to be like good soldiers of Christ. But we don't fight with weapons of this world. We don't fight with guns and fists and knives and machetes. We have spiritual power, spiritual strength, spiritual weapons, and we should endure hardship. If you walk with Jesus, you will face opposition. If you testify about Jesus as the Messiah, you will face hardship. In this world, you will have tribulation. You will have trouble. But take heart. Jesus has overcome this world. And we are pilgrims. We're just passing through this world. This is not our home. We have a heavenly home, and we're moving towards that heavenly city. So we need to endure hardship. The next imperative statement that I'll mention is from chapter 2, verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. We need to remember Jesus. Christianity is relational, and it is relational because Jesus is as alive today as he was when he walked on the earth. Jesus is alive. He was raised from the dead, and we can have, by his Spirit, a direct relationship with him. Chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says to Timothy, Try hard to show yourself worthy. The verse says, verse 15, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. I say amen to that. Paul is saying to Timothy, Do your best to come before God as somebody who is approved. Jim Elliot, when he was at Wheaton, this is Elizabeth Elliot's first husband who was killed in Ecuador, he said when he was studying in undergraduate school, that he wanted to get an AUG degree, a degree of AUG, approved unto God. And it's based on this here. Paul says to Timothy, and the Lord is saying to us, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. There's something there. A lot of people handle the Word of God, but they don't handle it correctly. We really need to be careful that as we speak the words of God, we do it in a correct manner and in a way that we're not ashamed of it. Verse 16 of chapter 2. This is a good one. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. I guess I'd say that much of what is on the internet is empty and worldly chatter. It's godless chatter. Um, Like I said, I'll read the news, and I realize that much of what they call news is really opinion, and a lot of it is gossip, just talking about famous people or news about something that really doesn't involve me, and it's... uh, it's kind of sweet tasting, but it's, it's unhealthy for the soul. And we need to avoid that, uh, which is one reason I don't click through on, I think, almost any, any headline that says this may happen or it could be this. Well, then it's just, they're just guessing at what might come to pass. I don't want to bother with reading that. We need to avoid godless chatter. We need to avoid those things because when we indulge in it, we become more and more ungodly. Well, that was an issue 2,000 years ago. That's why Paul wrote it to Timothy, and it's an issue for us now. Verse 22 of chapter 2, Paul says, Flee the evil desires of youth. Well, I don't really want to make a list of what those evil desires of youth could be. I'm sure some could pop into your head right now. And I will say that even as we get older, the evil desires of youth can still jump up and grab us. Sin is crouching. It's always crouching, ready to pounce. And the word here is, the imperative command is to flee. You don't stand up to the evil desires of youth. You just leave them. (laughs) Go away. Go the other direction. And that is actually the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Take us away from evil. 
the prayer in that case is not give us strength to stand up to evil. It's here. It's go away. Just flee it. Leave. Go the other direction. We need to turn away from evil desires, especially these youthful evil desires. Of course, Timothy was youthful. And so Paul is in a nice way telling him, grow up. You need to grow up. Put the evil desires of youth behind you. Verse 22 also says, Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with all those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So these two imperative commands here in chapter 2, verse 22, flee from one thing and pursue another. Flee from evil desires and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace. People who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, will be the people who pursue these things. They go after them. And we should be people who flee from evil desires and pursue, run after these godly characteristics, these traits that God wants to build deeper and deeper and deeper and more deeply into our spirits. We need to pursue righteousness, chase after faith, grasp at love, Hold on to peace. Amen. Verse 23, right after that, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because, well, you know, they produce quarrels. We need to avoid godless chatter. Don't have anything to do with foolish arguments. And to be quite honest, there are many foolish arguments now. And um, as nicely as I can, I will end the conversation or change direction if someone starts bringing up some foolish argument that really doesn't draw anyone closer to the Lord and is a distraction from the things of God. Don't have anything to do with these foolish arguments because it produces quarrels. You're fighting with other people. Contention. And we should avoid being contentious people. Verse 24 says, The Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone. Able to teach, not resentful. Don't be quarrelsome, be kind. Those are imperative statements. So I hope you're seeing here how these are the New Testament commandments. They are in a way, I won't say this too strongly, but in a way they're the equivalent of the Mosaic Law for those who were under the Mosaic Law. These are the New Testament imperative commands. And there's over a thousand of them in the New Testament. And you see how good they are. Don't have anything to do with argumentation, stupid and foolish arguments, because they make you quarrel with other people. But we, as the servants of God, should not quarrel. We should be kind to everyone, even the people that want to fight with us, even our enemies, of course. We should be kind to those people who want to quarrel with us. We shouldn't be resentful. A part of being kind to your enemies, loving your enemies, involves necessarily a selflessness and a confidence that is not based on self, but on God and his character. We can die to ourselves instead of defend ourselves if we're fully confident in the Lord. And in the last episode, I mentioned that we have nothing to fear. And if we have nothing to fear... And if we are dead to ourselves, then we can be kind to everyone. In verse 24, Paul continues with this line of thinking. Those who oppose him, meaning those who oppose the Lord's servant. The Lord's servant must, here I'll continue with what Paul wrote, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Should be a good teacher. We should be tolerant and gentle. We should be able to instruct people in peace, gently, to speak a firm truth in a gentle way, to speak the truth in love. We have plenty of examples, I think. I'm sure you've had examples where someone would speak the truth, but not in a loving way. And that can really tear people down and hurt people. And I see it all the time. People speak in a loving way, but it's not true. And that's equally bad. It feels better. Somebody who says something loving and it's sweet and it makes you feel good. But if it's not true, 
then it's leading us away from the paths of God. So we need to be good teachers, tolerant and gentle. We need to speak the truth in love. Now, at the beginning of chapter 3, I think I just want to read what Paul has written here. There's quite a bit, and it's good um, to talk about these things. Actually, I spoke at church uh, a few days ago, and I read this section as we talked about the end times. Uh, terrible times on the last days. So I want to read this. Paul says, to keep clear of people who put money and pleasure in the place of God. So, uh, starting in chapter 3, verse 1 of Second Timothy. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, but treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And now comes the imperative statement, have nothing to do with them. We are to be in the world but not of the world. And especially people that are in the church, honestly, who say that they are following Jesus and yet they exhibit these characteristics, we need to steer clear. Bad company corrupts good character. And what Paul is writing here is about the terrible times of the last days. And I believe we are in the last days We're not in the very last days, at the end of the age, but we're in these bad times where there are people like this in growing number, it seems. The culture encourages people to live like this, lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Oh, goodness, I'd say social media, the Internet, encourages people to be boastful and proud. Certainly, many cultures, Western culture that I'm familiar with, encourages children to be disobedient to their parents, encourages young people to be disrespectful to older people, to be ungrateful, unforgiving. Oh, yeah, here's a good one, to be without self-control. In verse 14 of chapter 3, Paul says to Timothy that he needs to stand by the truths that Timothy had learned. Here's what it says, starting in verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We need to stand by what we've learned. The scriptures say, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from sin if we walk in the light. We need to stand by these truths that we've learned. God will continue to teach us all through our days here on earth. He's going to continue that good work of making us more and more like Jesus. And we need to continue in what we've learned. Not learn it and walk away from it, like a person who looks in a mirror and walks away and forgets what they look like. We need to learn it and remember it and walk in it. Chapter 4, verse 5, Paul tells Timothy, keep calm. Well, I'll read what he says. But you, Timothy, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge the duties of your ministry. Well, there's a whole list here of imperative commands. Keep your head in all situations. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be afraid. Keep calm. Be sane. Be knowledgeable and understand. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. And here is where we started to endure hardship for the sake of the gospel of Jesus. Paul says to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Now, in this case, I would say that there are people who are listening to me. You are a gifted evangelist. You have been given the gift of evangelism, of reaching out to people. In Ephesians, Paul says that God gives evangelists to the church to help the church do what the church does. 
So from that, I take that an evangelist not only reaches out to unbelievers, but an evangelist within the church can help other evangelists reach out and help other members of the church reach out and share the gospel with people. So this is a word for people that are listening. Do the work of an evangelist. Don't just be turned in on yourself. Reach out. Look out. And here Paul says to Timothy that Timothy should do all of the duties of the calling that he's received. In Romans, Paul says, if your gift is leadership, you exercise leadership. You do it. If you're called to that ministry, you do it. All of the duties. And that is a word for all of us. That as we walk with the Lord, he will entrust things to us. And as we're faithful with these small things that he'll give us, then he'll give us more. And it's not a surprise at all. As we walk in the things of God and we discharge the duties of our calling, that God will entrust more to us. So those are the imperative commands to mention from 2 Timothy the statements of instruction that Paul gives to Timothy. I'll go through the list very quickly and then end with how Paul ends his letter to Timothy. Take your share of suffering. Take strength from the grace of God. Take your share of hardship. Remember Jesus Christ. Work hard to show yourself worthy of the gospel. Avoid empty and worldly chatter. Turn away from the evil desires of youth. Pursue justice, integrity, love, peace, righteousness, and faith. Have nothing to do with foolish speculations and arguments. Don't be quarrelsome. Be kind towards everyone. Be able to teach. Don't be resentful. Be tolerant and gentle. Keep clear of people who put money and pleasure and themselves before a life of discipleship. Be careful about that. Have nothing to do with them. Stand by the truths that you've learned. Continue in what you've been taught. Walk in the light as he is in the light. Keep calm at all times. Face hardship well. And discharge all the duties of your calling. And Paul closes this letter with something now that I want to share with you. May the Lord be with your spirit. And grace be with you. Amen. Jesus said to his disciples, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Thank you for listening, and God bless you all.